So an alternate approach was needed, and that approach had to do with a different uh, way of looking at discrete energy levels. This is under the heading of the wave-particle duality of matter and energy. But I want to talk to you about this guy. This guy, I don't think many of you remember Groucho Marx, but this guy looks a little bit like Groucho Marx. Um, he, he was actually, his name is Louis de Broglie, and Louis was a prince in the royal family of France at the turn of the uh, 20th century. And so he, he was able to go to any school that he wanted to go to, and his parents urged him to become an historian. Uh, and he went to a very good school, uh, uh, whose name I don't remember offhand, and he earned himself a bachelor's degree in history. Uh, then along came World War I. And he joined the army, and being uh, a person of some influence and connections and a very intelligent person, they put him in communications. And uh, during uh, the years from uh, 1914 to 1917, he was stationed at the Eiffel Tower uh, in charge of communications equipment there. And during all that period, my theory is he had a lot of time to think. And he finally decided that he was really excited about the advancement of science and mathematics and uh, physics, particularly physics. And uh, he, he uh, made a decision that he was going to go back to school. And he went back to school and got another degree in physics. But he had a lot of time to think about things. And uh, what, what he uh, was able to do was to find an alternate way to think about electrons and atoms. And he proposed a new reason for the existence of fixed energy levels in atoms. He said that atoms are like anything else which exists in fixed energy levels, and he picked a plucked guitar string as the primary example. When you pluck the string on a stringed instrument, uh, of course, the motion of the string is very complicated, very complex. And uh, if you analyze it mathematically, you find out that it's made up of a series of different contributions, something called the fundamental note, and then something called the first overtone and the second overtone to, the less, to a lesser extent, the higher overtones, went together to make up the uh, motion, the complex motion of the string. Now, uh, the standing, these are called standing waves because they, um, over a short period anyhow, are independent of time. And I have some standing waves here for you. Uh, this standing wave right here is the part of the motion that's called the fundamental frequency in a pluck guitar string anchored at 0 and 3.5 up here somewhere. And this is the first overtone. Notice the first overtone has a higher frequency than the fundamental note. And uh, if we go on down here, this is the second overtone, this is the third overtone, and each one of these have different wavelengths. As you can see, this represents half the wavelength of the fundamental. This is the full wavelength of the first overtone. And uh, what is it? One and a half of the second overtone and two of the third overtone and so forth. Uh, now what he said was each one of these being a standing wave is a fixed energy state that the string can be in. And he said if you look at this in terms of a guitar, uh, the fundamental note is like Bohr's ground state. It's the lowest energy state that the string uh, can uh, exist in. And then the first overtone is a little higher energy, like one of Bohr atoms' excited states. 
But we don't have to make any assumptions. This is the way it is. This is just basic physics. Uh, and what he said was, let's imagine that the electron in a hydrogen atom might exhibit wave-like properties under the conditions of the, of the atom itself. Now he said it would only be a standing wave if the head matched up to the tail. And what I mean by that, you could see here, uh, if we take a Bohr orbit as the best thing we have available right now, uh, if the, uh, if the uh, guitar string follows a Bohr orbit, then it will create standing waves uh, if the number of cycles around the orbit is an integer, a whole number. Okay, the head will match up to the tail, and this will be just like uh, the fundamental note, uh, only it's going to be on a circle rather than uh, on, in a straight line. Well, I don't know whether that works or not, uh, but his idea was that if you have a whole number uh, uh, amount of cycles, you get standing waves, and if you have anything else, these things will damp out and cancel. So the allowed states, uh, the allowed states of the uh, electron wave, quote unquote, are those where we have an integral number of wavelengths around around the orbit. Well, this means that maybe the electron can be described by wave wave characteristics, wave mathematics. Wave mathematics had already been worked out a long time ago by Newton. And de Broglie had a lot to work with, and he was able to derive uh, the de Broglie equation, which is shown here, which relates the wavelength of something that exhibits, exhibits wave uh, characteristics to the momentum. Uh, M is the mass, U is the velocity, so M times U is the momentum. And so this shows that the wave characteristic, the wavelength, is inversely related to the momentum. And uh, since that's true, heavy objects that have a big M are going to have very small wavelengths. In fact, if you take de Broglie's equation and apply it to a golf ball, the wavelength of the golf ball is so incredibly tiny we have no hope of either, even uh, uh, thinking about it constructively, let alone measuring it. Now, what he showed was that fast-moving electrons, where m is very small, uh, have a de Broglie calculated wavelength around 10 to the minus 10 meters. And the significance of that is that that's roughly the size of an atom. And that being the case, then an electron wave might have some chance of exhibiting important wave properties, and maybe that's what gives the electrons in a hydrogen atom only fixed energy levels that they can occupy. Now, uh, your book does some calculations of de Broglie wavelength. I don't think those are important for us. The idea is more important than actually calculating the numbers. That's just a um, calculator exercise. So we are not requiring you to do these calculations, but I would like for you to be familiar with the de Broglie equation because of its fundamental significance. Well, a while after that, um, a physicist by the name of Compton actually showed that de Broglie's uh, uh, equation does apply to photons. Now, we're talking not electrons now, but photons, and that photons have momentum. In fact, these pictures here are of light sails. Sometime later this year, the Planetary Society is uh, going to attempt to launch a light sail into orbit. There have actually been a couple of them already, and these things work like sailboats, but they use the light of the sun as a source of energy to move them around. Uh, so uh, this has been science fiction for a long time. It looks like it's going to be science fact pretty soon. So all of this kind of uh, strengthened de Broglie's uh, credibility, if you will. De Broglie 
did uh, very careful work, and that makes a difference in science. So um, now we need to begin thinking about what are the characteristics of wave phenomena uh, that are different from particles, because what he was proposing was kind of a wave-particle duality. Under some condition, the electrons might behave like a particle, have a mass and charge and so forth. Under other conditions, maybe they would behave in a more wave-like uh, approach. So I want to talk very briefly about wave diffraction. Uh, if you have, let's say, a jetty down at Galveston that has a hole in it, right? Uh, and here's, here's the jetty, and there's a hole, and there's a series of waves coming in. In the water behind the jetty, uh, you get propagation of the waves in, in what's called a semicircular wave, like this. If you haven't seen it, the next time you're down there, look for it, because there are a few jetties that's, that do have holes in them. Um, if you compare this to a stream of particles, like shining uh, a flashlight on a hole in a piece of cardboard, you get a beam. You don't get this propagation of a semicircular wave. So you can think of a beam of particles as having, uh, this is one way a beam of particles is different from a um, a wave, a set of waves here. Okay. Uh, now, if light waves pass through 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 two adjacent slits, each one of the slits or the holes uh, sources a semicircular wave. And if those waves come out of the two holes and they're lined up in terms of um, their uh, peaks and troughs here, then uh, there is what we call reinforcement. These two waves would reinforce and make a bigger wave that has a larger amplitude. And this, this, if you were the observer over here, you would see this as a sort of a bright spot because the, the uh, amplitude of the wave depend, de determines the brightness that your eye sees. On the other hand, if the waves came out so that peak was lined up with trough and trough with peak, then uh, this would be a dark spot because the amplitude would cancel out. So we have an up arrow here and a down arrow there of the same kind. So what we get here is a flat line with no oscillations in it. And that would mean as the observer over here, you would only see dark. Okay, so two holes and the wave front passing through them produces a series of angles where the waves go from in phase like they are over here to make a bright spot to out of phase like they are over here to make a dark spot. And this produces, if you were the observer over here on the right, and you were looking at this and it was based on light, you would see a series of bright and dark rings. These are called Newton's rings, as I understand it. And uh, uh, I, ha I found a picture of these. Uh, this is a, called a diffraction pattern, these circular um, alternating dark and light lines. Uh, and I found one that's produced by x-rays. Uh, so the question is, um, does the electron wave produce a diffraction pattern? If it's a real wave, if the electrons can behave as wave, and de Broglie was right, they should exhibit the interference possibility and diffraction. Now you need the right size holes for this to happen in. The holes have to be separated by a distance which has a close resemblance to the wavelength. And uh, many physicists started to uh, run experiments to try to see whether this would happen. The first ones who were successful were a couple of American physicists. There haven't been many, many Americans in my stories for you here yet. But Davison and Germer were American physicists. They produced electron beams. Uh, and in 1927, they published a paper that showed 
uh, that electron beams are diffracted by aluminum foil. And uh, the electrons, therefore, are undergoing interference, positive or constructive and destructive interference, and that produces these rings. And from that, de Broglie's whole idea was um, solidified, if you will. Electrons, under some conditions, do behave as waves. OK, that opened a really big door because, as I said a few moments ago, wave mathematics was fully developed at that point. But wait, this guy just said this. This fellow's name is Werner Her uh, Heisenberg. Werner Heisenberg. He said, if an electron has both particle and wave properties, how can you ever know where it is? If it's behaving as a wave, uh, in, only in general terms can you describe where a wave is. You could describe where a given spot on a wave might be, but he was concerned that um, that sort of took away the regular physics view of things, uh, whereby you would like to know where something is and how fast it's moving. He said, with this approach, you can't do that. And in fact, his uncertainty principle, uh, which he is known uh, far and wide about, said that you can't determine the exact position and the exact energy of a wave particle like an electron simultaneously. So you have to give up one of them. And uh, since it was very important to talk about fixed energies of electrons and atoms, what they did was they picked energy and they gave up knowing where the electron was. From there came the concept of electron density that we'll be talking about. And this was the second step into quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics cannot prescribe exact path for electrons. So Bohr's orbits had to be kicked out again, even though they didn't work and were kicked out already. You could not specify a fixed orbit uh, because that would mean that you couldn't give the precise energy of the electron that was in that orbit. And they wanted to use the energies. At best, you could talk about the probability of finding the electron in a given volume of space. And we have come to think about that idea as representing electron density, right? The probability of finding the electron in a volume of space that we 